Liberals in the West consider themselves to be loving and accepting people, but are often so open-minded their brains fall out. This is seen in a variety of ways, but today I'm talking about how society has begun to allow the mentally ill to dictate public policy. The most recent example of this comes from the Netherlands, where a healthy 28-year-old woman with depression has decided to kill herself with the help of the government, and now we all have to pretend her incredibly idiotic decision is both stunning and brave. The Netherlands, though, may be on to something. While the Nazis were bad for a variety of reasons, one of which they held strong belief in eugenics and fought to sterilize the mentally ill, the Dutch can simply ask people to volunteer to be put down and still be the good guys. After all, the last thing we need in the West is another woman complaining about how hard she has it. And sure, the fact that all of these women are autistic might seem icky and gross, but it's important to remember that liberals care very deeply about the lives of other people, and if those people want to die, then damn it, who's to say that they're wrong? After all, it's a basic human right to be murdered by the government. I'm Tyler Cressman. Welcome to the Cressman Conversation. Okay, so as we said in the intro video today, we're going to be talking about euthanasia, sort of. We're not going to get into, well, maybe we will actually, who knows, we'll see where we go. We're going to be talking about euthanasia because of this one particular case, but before that, actually, I'm just going to give some thoughts on euthanasia in general. Now, I have been involved in the medical field for quite a while, and I know a little bit about medicine. I won't pretend to know anything about anything, but I know a little bit about something. And one of the things I know is that we have in the United States, we have hospice, I believe a couple states, maybe Oregon, I don't know who else actually at this point, I I didn't look it up before the podcast, but I know a couple states have a euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide program in place. Most of the other states have hospice which is similar but not similar at the same time. Hospice is a little bit less of a assisted suicide, although let's not kid ourselves when we're giving people who are on the verge of death large amounts of painkillers, we are facilitating that death. So there's a little bit of a gray area there. But it exists in the West. Is it a good thing? Now, as I just said a moment ago, with my limited understanding of medicine, I will say this. If I get to be older or I get diagnosed with a terminal illness, something like pancreatic cancer or stomach cancer where they say, hey, we've done all we can do, there's no hope, you're going to die. I'm not opposed to it. I do not morally find it a problem for me to then say, well, I will live my life until it gets to a point where I'm either no longer me or in too much pain or this or that, and I want it to be done. I see no moral problem with this. Some people do. Some people think in every single case it is a moral problem. That's not my personal opinion. What I think is you fight to the point where it makes no more sense to fight, and then that's it. What we're talking about today, though, is not that. What we're talking about today is not euthanasia for people who are elderly with terminal illnesses, which is a... a completely separate issue that deserves its own conversation. What we're talking about today is this case from the Netherlands that I find troubling for a variety of reasons we're going to get into, but let's first talk about some specifics of the case. Oh, I did pull this fact up because I was curious about this. So the Netherlands in 2001, now actually the long may not have been passed until 2002, but it was put in place in 2001. But for the last 20 years, the Netherlands was the first country to legalize any sort of physician-assisted suicide program, and it had been going for 20 years now. And over the course of 20 years, in 2002, there were 8,720 deaths from euthanasia in the Netherlands. This represented 5% of all the country's deaths and was up from 4% the previous year. So about 5% of all the people who die in the country choose to die by euthanasia. This to me seems really high, but we don't have much to compare it on in the West. So I don't know if it is high or if that's how many people a year die from terminal disease or what the case is, but it seems high. 
8,000 people doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking 5% of all the deaths in a country, it seems high. Again, not necessarily the focus of today's conversation, but the an interesting thing to, to note. The Netherlands has a very, I won't say very long history. It's been 20 years, but the longest history in the world about programs like this, and it's it now accounts for 5% of all the deaths in the country. Just something to keep in mind as we talk about the new case and and expanding the role. So this new case we're talking about is the case of, and I am going to just butcher this young woman's name, I'm sure, but it looks like Zoraya Terbeek. Z-O-R-A-Y-A, middle name Tur, or first part of the last name Tur, T-E-R, last name Beek, B-E-E-K. Zoraya Terbeek. I haven't heard anyone say it. I've just read it, so I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce it. But this woman is 28 years old. She is from a small village on the German border in the Netherlands and is scheduled to be euthanized in May. Now, now the interesting thing about this is that Zarea has no terminal illnesses. She is 28 years old. She is a healthy individual, but Zarea has depression and has decided that her depression is such that she no longer wants to live. Now, she has a 40-year-old boyfriend and two cats. And in a lot of the articles I have read, this is the quote that she says she was told by her psychiatrist. The quote was, quote, there's nothing more we can do for you. It's never going to get any better, end quote. And then she said, okay, well, if the psychiatrist says that the... There's nothing that's going to get better for me in this world. Then I just, I want to die. And so the Netherlands have allowed this woman to go through the process of scheduling a, her death in May. And it is on the calendar. It is all got the legal go ahead, the approval, which means that a doctor is going to come to her house in May while she sits on her couch and is going to give her a sedative that puts her to sleep and is then going to administer a drug that stops your heart. This is what I mean when I say liberals sometimes are too accepting of what other people want. This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. Suicide is an inherently selfish act. Do not mistake that. In every case, it is a selfish act. You are taking whatever pain or whatever discomfort you have in life, you're putting it paramount and first and foremost, when you kill yourself, whether it's physician assisted or anything, the pain that you have to deal with in this world no longer exists. But the pain that you cause anyone else in the world, it exists for everybody else. It is a selfish act to kill yourself in every case. And this woman apparently has a 40-year-old boyfriend and two cats. She says she loves her boyfriend. I guarantee you she does not because if you are in love, if you have love for other people, this is not something you do. And has two cats, which women like this, they don't have kids anymore. They just have cats. So it's not a good thing to allow people to kill themselves when they are suicidal. Now, there are actually laws in the United States, again, to put on the hat of guy who knows a little bit about medicine. There are laws in the United States. If I say I'm suicidal, if I say, oh, I want to kill myself, then I am, I can be put into protective custody. I can be taken to the hospital. I can be placed on a 72-hour hold. I can be put on suicide watch. I am not allowed to tell someone, for example, a police officer or a first responder or even my friend or my spouse or whoever. I'm not allowed to say that I'm going to kill myself, and then I'm just allowed to wander about society to do so freely. In this country, we take those people who are having issues, having episodes, having depression, having all this stuff, we take them to somewhere where we can attempt to help them. Now, I will admit our system for dealing with mental health in this country is clunky. It's not great. But it's often because we don't understand mental health. We want to, in this country, tend to want to throw drugs at mental health problems when they're not, it's not chemical imbalance. The chemical imbalance argument about mental health is sort of nonsense at this point. 
most people who say that they have depression don't actually have depression. What they have is a case of the SADS. It's the not the same thing. Don't get it twisted. So we have laws in this country that protect the suicidal from themselves. In countries like the Netherlands, they're moving to a place where they're saying, well, actually, just having depression is such an illness that is impossible to overcome. They're going to allow you to just kill yourself with the assistance of the government. This is not good. This is not the right message to send. This woman is 28 years old. It's sad that she has issues, but she's the things that they listed off, and you read the articles about her, the things that they're listing off, she has autism, she has ADHD, she has depression, and you say, what, which of these is Warren's death? Now, I, I feel bad that she is depressed. That's not good. And if you're depressed enough to the point that you want to kill yourself or you're actually going to go ahead and kill yourself, which this woman is, that's bad. That's not a good thing. I get that you say, oh, uh, well, she doesn't want to live. We should respect that. Why should we respect that? Mental health is so poorly understood in the world and especially in the Western country. Depression doesn't exist like it does in the West in countries that are not industrialized. You'll see people on the streets that have in places like Bangladesh and India who have better mental health than the average suburban teenager these days. Why is that? It's not because their access to a quality of life is better. It's because they know struggle. People in the West don't struggle. And therefore, every little inconvenience is a hardship. Every little thing that goes wrong in their life is a hardship that they can't endure. There's no mental fortitude that is built into people in the West anymore. And just in general. And obviously, there are people out there who are mentally tough, but people don't understand how to facilitate that. And the younger people, people younger than myself, so what they saw is around 1994, there's a shift in the raising of children. And children from 1994 on were raised differently than kids born before that time. So I'm sort of the tail end of the last generation who were raised like kids in the 80s and 70s. And you have this switch to a new generation, the online generation. Kids who, they don't go out and socialize, they don't take responsibility, they don't work jobs, they don't have sex, they don't do drugs, like their parents did, they, they're, they're less adventurous. And a lot of this came from overprotective parenting in the 90s, the helicopter parents in the 90s who fostered a generation of insecure and anxious children who are unable to handle conflicts on their own. And therefore, as they grow up, they have a prolonged adolescence. They are, they are children into their 20s. And it's not great for the mental health of children, for their parents to solve all their problems, for their parents to helicopter problem, um, parent them, for their parents to want to be the facilitator of all conflict, the mediator. These are not good things. These are not good qualities. Children need independence and the ability to handle problems on their own. They need this to make it so that when they become adults, they can handle their adult problems like adults and not like children who run to their parents. This woman reminds me of that, reminds me of, you live in the Netherlands. I don't know much about her life. I will admit, she could have had the world's most terrible life of all time. None of the articles mention it. She hasn't mentioned it. She's not mentioned anything about her terrible, abusive, this. She hasn't mentioned anything about her, her struggles with poverty, with, with food security, she, none of this. None of this has been mentioned. All it is is she's depressed. She's autistic. Oh, okay, what, what is her problem? What is the deal? What is, what is there to be depressed about in life? And what is depression? Is depression feeling sad? That's part of the human condition. Everyone feels sad. So where do we draw the line at depression? I've seen what depression looks like. Depression looks like can't shower, can't leave bed, can't eat, Wasting away to nothing. That's depression to me. A, a sadness that affects your ability to work or maintain relationships or leave the house or do basic care for yourself. People who get up and go to work and socialize and do all these things, if it just have that general feeling, that malaise that's over them, that, that sort of lack of understanding towards their other people, 
That is not the same thing. What that is is a lack of direction. What that is is a lack of focus. What that is is a lack of connection to humanity. And maybe you're not living the life you're supposed to live, and that's what that feeling is. But is that a feeling worth killing yourself over? Is that a feeling that we should say, well, there's nothing we can do for you? There's something everyone can do to improve their situation on life at any given moment. People need challenges. They need direction. They need adventure. They need something. They need a purpose in life. And many people don't have a purpose. This woman, she, I guarantee you, she has no purpose. And what I mean is that is that it not that it exists. It doesn't exist. What I mean is that she doesn't know it. And because she doesn't know that purpose, she has nothing. She feels like can tether her to reality, to tether her to this world, and therefore she's depressed, and therefore she's going to kill herself. It used to be that people knew what their purpose was because they didn't question everything all the time constantly. And it's good. It's good to question things. I won't, I'm not going to say you should listen to everyone. In fact, that's typically what I tell you not to do. You shouldn't just listen. You should do your own thinking, do your own research. You should do these things. But what you shouldn't do is throw everything out and become unmoored from any sort of societal norms or history of the world. That's not what we should do. We can't throw everything away. We're not, we're not Descartes, all right? We're not going to, we don't have to take it back to the first principles. We don't have to, we don't have to think cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am and then build up from there. Not everyone needs to do that. We don't have to throw everything out and reason our way into the world. We don't have to. But what we have to do is find something in society that we can latch on to that gives you direction or gives you purpose. Maybe it's a job, okay? This is not a good, I wouldn't say that this is the best path to go down. Maybe it's finding work you love. It used to be growing up, finding a spouse, getting married, having children. That was, that was the purpose that many people aspired to in life. We're not having children as much as we did in the past. We're not getting married as much as we did in the past. This woman has two cats. I guarantee you she's the kind of woman who calls her cats her babies. All right? I have a cat. All right? Look at this. She's sitting in my lap right now. Say hi, Winnie. Say hello. See? I got a cat. You know what I don't do? I don't treat the cat like a a child. All right? The cat's a cat. I like the cat. Cat's great. It's fine to have pets. Pets are fine. Pets are not a replacement for children. They're not. People who walk around like, I'm a dog mom. All right. No, you're not. You have a dog. All right. I have a cat. You have a dog. It's fine. Pets are, pets are fun. Pets are good. They're goofy. It is not a purpose in life to have a pet. It can be a purpose in life to have a child. This woman is probably the kind of woman who grew up and said, I'm never going to have kids. I love my independent, strong lifestyle yet now you're 28 years old and you're going to kill yourself because you don't have anything in reality that tethers you to anything normal you don't have a life you don't have a purpose you don't have a goal and you but you have two cats isn't that great you have a 40 year old boyfriend that's a 28 year old woman i guess that's fine you know 12 years seems like a big age gap but who am i i'm not going to sit there and judge do whatever you want my point is people need a purpose it can be a family, it can be work, it can be your religion, your, your spiritual life, whatever you want to say, but you need a purpose. You need to challenge yourself. You need something, that, a goal to move towards. When you don't have a goal, when you don't have anything, and the goal doesn't have to be big. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to play for the Denver Broncos. I'm going to write a New York Times best-selling book. I'm going to become rich and famous doing X, Y, and Z. It, those are not, those are, they're goals. If you want to have those goals, that's great. But you need day-to-day goals. I have, I have goals that I have every day. I have a couple, a couple of different things on my checklist. They're, they're moving towards bigger things. But just a couple things you do every day. Like for me, example, I journal every day. I try and do my thousand words of writing every day. I will, oh, I've been studying Spanish. My Spanish is terrible, but I do it every day. 
little things, right? Little things. And then every year I make New Year's resolutions. Some people like them. I know I've done topics on the past about it. But you say you need goals. Anything in life that you're moving towards that gives you purpose, that gives you a reason to get up in bed uh, from bed in the morning, those are good things. And it's something that we're losing in the West. And therefore we say, well, this woman is depressed. Let her die with dignity. There's nothing dignified about giving up. That's cowardice. This woman is dying with cowardice as a 28-year-old with no health problems. This is not, it's not a good thing. And I, I was reading, this is, I pulled some, a couple things here that I thought were interesting. So here's something, this is a quote from her. She did an interview, I guess, and this is a quote that I pulled from one of the articles I read. This is her quote. This is what she's talking about when she's talking about dying on her couch. This is it, quote. The doctor really takes her time. It is not that they walk in and say, lay down, please. Most of the time, it is first a cup of coffee to settle the nerves and creates a soft atmosphere. Then she asks if I'm ready. I will take my place on the couch. She will once again ask if I am sure, and she will start up the procedure and wish me a good journey, or in my case, a nice nap, because I hate it if people say safe journey. I'm not going anywhere, end quote. That's this woman talking about dying on her couch with some doctor, some bad physician who doesn't remember the first part of the Hippocratic Oath, who is going to come over to murder her while she sits on the couch. And she's just saying, oh, it's just nice. It's like a cup of coffee for the nerves. And then we, we put on, actually, she said no music, but we create a soft atmosphere. What, is she going to have a candle burning? I might have a candle going, or I'm going to take a nice nap on the couch. It's not, by the way, don't say safe journey to this woman because she's not going anywhere. She knows that. She went later on to say, oh, it's the big unknown when you die. But yet she said, don't wish her a safe journey because she's not going anywhere. She knows she's not going anywhere. Let me tell you something, by the way. I am a believer in that suicide, if, if you say Christianity or Judaism is true, if you believe in either of those, I can't speak for, I don't know the equivalent of hell in other religions, but I know in those two, that is a gigantic cardinal sin there. That is one of the, that is a big no-no. There, that is a biblical hell no about killing yourself. So, Pascal's wager. If you're wrong, then you're going to kill yourself as a 28-year-old. If you go somewhere, it ain't going to be a nice place. I'll tell you that. And that's just, again, a personal belief. If those religions are correct and you're wrong or whatever the case may be, that is not going to be a pleasant journey you're going to wish you took. I, I promise you that. This is, by the way, there's, this is not an isolated case. This happened in, in Canada recently. This, the Canada's got some weird rules about their courtroom, so you can't get all the info. But Justice Colin Feesby of the King's Court Bench of Alberta, there's a 27-year-old woman who is going to be allowed to access the medical assistance in dying against her father's wills, be, who argued that she was not competent to make decisions because this woman was, and I thought I pulled that up here. I believe, again, she's autistic with depression and all these things, and they're saying that she too is going to be allowed to die in Canada, America's evil top hat, the, because she's depressed. And her father is saying, this is ridiculous. My daughter's autistic, and she doesn't make good decisions about her medical care what are you allowing this woman to die for? And I, I got to say, I just agree. If you're, if you're the father in this case, how can you look at Canada as anything other than murdering your child who you're saying, I've made the decisions for her for everything basically in her life because she's pretty severely autistic and doesn't make good decisions but yet you're going to allow her to access this program and kill herself. Why is this a good thing? Who's, who thinks this is a good idea? I don't understand it. I also pulled a quote here from the Protestant Theological University healthcare ethics professor, Theo Boren. 
Protestant Theological University Healthcare Ethics. That is a hell of a title. One, two, three, four, five, six, six words in his title, his job title. That's pretty damn long guy. Maybe you should shorten it. But he was the person who served on the Euthanasia Review Board in the Netherlands. He served there from 2005 until 2014, so about nine years. And it is a quote he told the free press. He said that euthanasia, quote, evolved from death being a last resort to death being the default option, end quote. So the guy who served on the ethics board also has said that this euthanasia thing has, is being a, becoming a problem because they're looking at it more of a solution rather than an option. And that's something we don't want to do. We don't want to look at it as a solution. We want to look at it as a last resort. Again, fight to the end. That's my opinion. Fight to the end, and, but when there's no point in fighting, there's, there's no moral harm in allowing nature to take its course. That's what I, that's what I think. If you're, if you're going to die, I don't need to suffer an extra week or month in excruciating pain, dying, not really remembering anything, not able to communicate, not being myself. I don't think that. I really don't. I don't see a moral quandary there when it comes to euthanasia. As a 28-year-old, I'm, I'm 33 right now. If I went to the Netherlands and said, I want to kill myself because I'm sad, then that is a moral problem. That's a moral failing to allow me to do this. It's not because you're being kind to me. It's not compassionate to allow people to mistreat themselves. This is something I've said about a, a number of things. The homeless crisis or the, the, the trans debate, Whatever it is, it's not compassionate to allow people to do things that are harmful. When you allow homeless people with mental problems to live on the streets in their own filth because you say we can't lock them up or medicate them, that's not compassionate. It's not helping them. It's not helping society. When you ignore research that says that the majority of children grow out of any sort of trans behavior by the time that they reach adulthood, when you ignore that and then start transitioning children, you say, well, that's not helping them because now you have a bunch of people who grow up to be in their 20s who have now detransitioned but made life-altering decisions about their medical care when they were young because when you're young, you're an idiot. And if your parents push you along or allow you to behave in a way that is harmful to you, then that's going to be a problem when you're an adult. These are not good things. And it's not, but it's not a lack of compassion that I say that. It's the opposite. It's people who think that they're having compassion, that are making a mistake, that think that they're being the nice person. I, I'm all about personal individual liberty, but you can't allow somebody without the reasoned capacity to make decisions that will harm themselves when they're not competent to make those decisions. If you suffer from schizophrenia, you aren't competent to make a decision that you want to live in your own filth. If you're a child... You're not competent to make a decision about the rest of your life and your body. How many young women in their teenage years say things like, well, I never want to have kids, who then grow up to be mothers? I bet the number of people who have ever uttered that phrase, who then grew up to be mothers, is astronomically high. It is, you can't count it. You can't fathom it. Because every teenage girl, not everyone, but so, so many girls in high school or whatever, they say, oh, I never want kids. I just want to be me and live my fantasy life. It, this is not a real thing. But then they grow up and they mature and they grow up and they make different choices because adults, when your prefrontal cortex is fully established by the time you're 25 and you have the ability to reason and rationally make decisions, well, they make different decisions than when they were 16. But now we're letting children and we're letting the mentally incompetent make their own decisions. This woman just saying that you want to kill yourself is, is grounds for mental incompetence in my view. You're 28. Again, we're not talking about a person who's 75 with life-ending cancer. That might be a rational decision. You're 28. You have depression. That's not a rational decision. No one looks at the, that equation and says... Yeah, that makes sense to me. It doesn't make any sense. It's not, a good, it's not a good choice, and it's not a good thing for society to allow people to do this. There's a, moral, there's a moral decay that is happening in the West, and this is just a symptom. And what if, 
it spreads. What if it keeps coming? In Oregon, they have, well, Oregon is probably the most liberal state in the United States, at least off the top of my head that I'm thinking of. It's even worse than California, worse than Hawaii. So you have Oregon. You have a, they were the first state that legalized things like marijuana, which again, I'm fine. That's fine. Good. I'm, I'm for that one. But they're also the first state that legalized euthanasia. Okay. I'm fine with that. Again, I told you my opinion on being elder or terminal illnesses. That's fine. But they're also the first state that legalized all drugs. They said, oh, every drug, we're going to decriminalize. I don't know if they legalized it, but they decriminalized every drug. And what happens? Well, they, they do that, and they saw rates of addiction and overdose skyrocket. The opposite of what was supposed to happen, right? Taking the stigma away was supposed to allow people to get treatment, allow people to not long, no longer get in trouble with the law. It was supposed to help the hard drug problem, made it worse. They're the first state that tries things. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. But what happens if they want to try something like this? Are we going to allow Oregon to be a state, a destination state for people with depression who want to just go there to Oregon to kill themselves? Do we think that's going to be beneficial for the United States or for Oregon? And again, I don't know if Oregon's going to do this, but they're all, they seem to always be the first on the very, very liberal fringe. So I can imagine them being the first. My point is, is it good for the United States? Would this be a good policy here? How many people walk around taking their Xanax and their Ritalin and whatever, their Percocets, they're taking drugs every day of their life just to feel like, oh, anyone with the lean, the amitriptylines, the sertraline, the, the lithium, the freaking people out there without schizophrenia or bipolar disorder just taking lithium these days. It's insane. And... Yet, we're going to let those people all jacked up on the pharmacological influence of Big Pharma make decisions to end their life, and we think it's a good thing. I don't know. It, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm way off base here. Maybe people think this is a good idea, and I'm just misreading the entire situation. It's totally possible. I don't know. I don't think so. I think that this is a, again, just a symptom of a, the moral decay that we're going through, this idea that there's no longer anyone to be accountable to other than your own personal feelings. It's selfish. It's a selfish world we live in, and it's a selfish act to kill yourself, especially when the you haven't even lived to half your life expectancy. To act like things could never get better, it always can get better. That's the point. It always can get better. It's about choices you make. It's about finding purpose, uh, surrounding yourself with people that good friends, good loved ones, someone you can come home to. Those are the things that matter. Purpose and forward motion in life is all we have. We can just put our head down and work and grind your way towards something better, and you can do it every day. Every day you wake up and you can choose to be spiteful or you can choose to be grateful, and that choice will determine the outcome that you live by. I, I actually... You know, I should have pulled this up beforehand. There's, this is great. This is where we should embrace stoicism. Marcus Aurelius had a quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it here because I don't have it pulled up, but it's something along the lines of the world, the world is colored by the quality of your thoughts, something along that line. But the point is that the way that you choose to envision the world, the way that you choose to perceive a situation is how the situation is. Or, as Jocko Wilnick might put it, good. Good is all you can say. Something goes wrong, you know what? Good. Something gets canceled, good. You got more time to prepare. The presentation didn't go your way, good. It gives you something to work on to be better next time. You didn't get the promotion, good. More time to perfect your job. However you choose. Oh, I didn't get promoted, I'm sad. Okay, yeah, you can be sad or you can choose. Okay, you know what? It's supposed to happen this way. I just got more time to better myself and get better, and I'll get it next time. Those are two mindsets to the same problem. Which one you choose to have is going to dictate how good or how bad your life is. That's all you can control. You cannot control external influence on you. You can't. The world is going to, ha the world is going to happen around you no matter what, but you can control how you yourself take in those actions, process those thoughts, and then put 
energy, either positivity or negativity out into the world. That is the only thing you can control. Or as uh, somebody once said, the only thing you control is your response. There's stimuli, stimuli over here. There's response over here. And in the middle is a gap. And all we control is the gap. The stimulus comes in. There's a gap where we process. And then our response is whatever it's going to be. And taking that gap and minding that gap and figuring out how to control that gap, something comes in that makes you, would it make you so angry and you say, hold on, take a breath, take a breather, process, 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 and then you don't come back with anger. Again, it's something I'm not saying I do this to perfection, but it's the way that the world works. And it's the only solution that can help in this world. Finding purpose, controlling your emotions, not allowing people who are incompetent to dictate how society should run. These are the things we need to do. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know if I'm way off base. Tell me in the comments. You think I'm totally out of place or if I'm totally misreading the situation or thoughts on depression, anxiety in this younger generation. Anything. Just let me know. As always, I'm Todd Cressman. I will catch you guys next week.